Good morning, everyone. Um, I will get started. I think a few people are still um, coming into our Zoom room, but um, in the interest of time, we want to leave as much time as possible for Dr. Stewart today. So um, good morning. Um, I'm Matt State, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to this year's Evelyn Lee Visiting Scholar Lecture in Cultural Competency and Diversity. Uh, this annual endowed lectureship is in remembrance of Dr. Lee, who served as a clinical faculty member at UCSF for more than 20 years before her passing in 2003. Uh, the lectureship aims to further her mission of expanding diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of mental health by bringing us prominent experts to share their experiences and expertise uh, with trainees, faculty, and staff. I want to take just a moment um, to uh, remind you about Dr. Lee. She came to UCSF in the early 80s, and she joined the Asian Focused Psychiatric Inpatient Unit at San Francisco General Hospital as program director. Uh, in the late 80s, she founded the Chinese Family Alliance of Mentally Ill, and in 1992, she helped to organize the Nikos Chinese Health Coalition. This is a public-private community partnership of dozens of health and human service organizations whose mission continues to this day to be to enhance the health and well-being of San Francisco's Chinese community. Dr. Lee wrote and taught on a wide range of topics, including cross-cultural communication, refugee trauma, immigrant acculturation, intergenerational conflict resolution, the role of religion and complementary alternative and integrative medicine approaches. She was very widely respected and loved in the mental health field and the Asian American community as a clinician, administrator, teacher, author, community advocate, and humanitarian. So in reflecting on her work, I think it is striking that we continue decades later now to struggle with such profound challenges, fighting anti-Black racism, combating violence, discrimination, and structural inequities facing indigenous communities, all people of color, religious and cultural minorities and immigrants from across the globe. In fact, I don't think that there's ever been a more important time for us to connect with our history of advocacy and engagement that inspired Dr. Lee, uh, and, and motivated the establishment of this lectureship and continues to drive us as a department where diversity, equity, and inclusion is a central pillar in our quadripartite mission. For this reason, we could not be more excited today to have Dr. Stewart here to talk with us about cultural competence and diversity, particularly in the mental health setting. And I'm so thankful that she's agreed to meet with us throughout the day uh, to talk with our trainees, staff, and faculty about our undoing anti-Black racism work and our broad diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. So in the interest of time, I'm going to turn over the Zoom mic uh, to Dr. Christina Mangurian, our outstanding Vice Chair for Diversity and Equity, who, as all of you know, is not only a departmental, but an institutional and national leader working in this area. She's going to talk with you a little bit more about today's event, and then uh, Dr. Ashley Hubbard will introduce Dr. Stewart. Dr. Mangurian. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. So yes, this is uh, the big education event by the Diversity Committee of the Year. Nicholas can share with you our website that has a lot of our outstanding prior recipients. Um, and this um, really happens through a formal selection process. And I want to really give a shout out to the Education Subcommittee and especially Dr. Ashley Hubbard and Lydia Santiago for their leadership. Um, you know, it was definitely very clear that Dr. Stewart was going to be our leader, our, our speaker this year um, for very good reasons. And Dr. Hubbard will list out um, Dr. Stewart's incredible accolades and accomplishments. Uh, but I wanted to start with something a little bit more personal. Um, I got uh, to meet Dr. Stewart when I was first just a resident giving my first talk at the American Psychiatric Association. And I remember it very well seeing her and, and the late uh, Dr. Carl Bell in the audience. There were only like about 10 people there, um, but she was there. And every opportunity since then that I've gotten to spend time with her, I feel so fortunate. And that's because as you'll see today, she's not only brilliant and wise and outstanding communicator and extremely skilled and talented leader, but in my mind, her secret sauce is really how she makes you feel when she talks to you and you spend time with her. Um, she makes you feel valued, heard, special and cared for. And I'm just really so grateful for her and for her um, having her as a colleague and as a friend. 
So I'm really wondering, it's really a treat to have her all day long. And now I'll turn over uh, to Dr. Hubbard to describe um, a little bit more about the incredible work and career uh, Dr. Seward has had. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to have uh, Dr. Altha Stewart uh, speaking us, with us today as part of the Evelyn Lee Lecture. And Dr. Stewart is a Senior Associate Dean for Community Health Engagement, an Associate Professor and Director in the Division of Public and Community Psychiatry, the Director of the Center for Health and Justice Involved Youth at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, and has served as a past president of the American Psychiatric Association. The lecture today is entitled, The Roles of Social Determinants of Mental Health, Workforce Diversity, and Community Engagement in Achieving Mental Health Equity. Um, so that's just a, a really, there's much more that I could share um, about her work and accomplishments. But in the interest of time, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, uh, for speaking with us today. And we are really excited to hear your presentation. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lassalay, for that nice abbreviated introduction. I really appreciate that. It's so embarrassing sometimes. Um, and I, I also want to thank Christina and Matt as leaders in the department. Um, I, I value very much your interest in hearing from me. And Christina, if you ever want to bring me to tears, mention that first presentation again, because Carl Bell and I were so proud to be there. Uh, small groups give you a chance to show facial and body reactions that get missed in large groups. And, and both Carl and I understood from, from our earliest, earliest days in training ourselves, how important it is to get that visual feedback. So we were doing our best not to be beaming with pride, but to kind of every now and then give that, hmm, that's an interesting point, kind of a look to you and keep you wondering uh, how things were going. But in the interest of time, let me also uh, thank all of you who have appeared today. Uh, it is certainly my honor to be honored in this way uh, as I was saying to your, your leadership team before we started, in many ways for me, cultural psychiatry is the cradle for it actually is in uh, San Francisco at UCSF. I believe I saw Dr. Uh, Francis Lou join and Francis and I are contemporaries. We go back to our training days and I vividly remember first hearing about the uh, minority focus groups and wondering why my, uh, my, why my hospital didn't do that. It was such a wonderful idea. Uh, and always being just a little jealous that San Francisco seemed to be on the cutting edge of so many things while well, I trained in the East, on the East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic area. And, and we never quite seemed to be as um, upstanding of these ideas as everyone else. So I, I greatly appreciate being invited to talk today and to spend the day. I'm looking forward to it. And um, I will tell you before we get started, and I practice sharing slides, so there should be no problem with this. Um, if all goes well, can you see those? Yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> I should tell you that I gave a long title so I would remind myself to talk for a short time. It's, it's one of those unique kinds of ways that the brain works that when I know I've given all of this stuff at, as the title, that I've got to be very succinct. And, and I'm going to spend the next half hour or so just going through some ideas and thoughts. Um, in the area of cultural competence and diversity, um, you know, it, it's, it's more than an honor to be here uh, delivering this lecture uh, as part of the Evelyn Lee Visiting Lectureship due to tremendous um, contributions that she made. But it's also a lifelong pursuit of mine professionally to drill down deeper and deeper and deeper into these things. And so the three areas that are listed in my title today are really the areas where I spend most of my current day working on cultural competence and diversity in psychiatry. 
Um, as you heard, I'm Senior Associate Dean for Community Health Engagement. And so my, my work in the community engagement area is broadened now beyond the community mental health focus that I've had for, for decades now. But in essence, I'm still doing the work that I trained to do uh, over four decades ago. Uh, and, and, and I want to just share a few ideas that I have and some thoughts that I have about each of these areas going forward. Before I start, however, um, let's see if I can advance my slide. Ah, there we go. Uh, I include, of course, as this is a CME activity, I include, of course, my financial disclosures and conflict of interest statement, having none of either. Uh, regarding this presentation. But I've also begun to add as I've talked more and more about these things, um, because I, I envisioned this as a dialogue ultimately, that I needed to make sure, and I've adapted these from my very dear friend and colleague, Ruth Shim, uh, about talking about issues of race, culture, ethnicity, uh, structural racism, and all of the, the words that will be, be tossed around today over the course of the day. This is the disclaimer that I have adapted from Ruth. And, and this is just for purposes of everyone in the, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone in the audience to understand. This is <clears throat> how I enter this conversation. Um, recognizing and acknowledging that it may be difficult for some, that these are complex issues and feelings that derive from those issues, that many people will feel personally that this is about them when it is in fact not, and that I really do have no specific agenda. Uh, in the abbreviated introduction, you've heard that a small town girl from the South who was encouraged not to go to medical school uh, by one of my uh, counselors because it would just be too hard for me. Um, and, you know, I was a good student, but it would just be too hard for me to have uh, ascended to the level of president of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, I've done my agenda work over the course of my career. So this is not about agenda. This is about information sharing and hopefully about movement forward. And then finally, that in the context of these kinds of uh, discussions, I believe we must always start by giving grace to each other and ourselves and considering this, this space that we are about to, to enter, a gracious space. And that, that carries a lot of um, issues and, and concerns for many people. Uh, but for me, what it means is that I take positive energy into this, and I hope I will receive your positive energy as a result of being here. But remember, I'm a Southern girl from the Bible Belt, so people may interpret that in all kinds of ways. Okay, I'm going to actually start at the end where I, in my title, if you remember, it was to achieve health equity. So I'm actually going to start there. And I'm a fan of word clouds because they help me to remember many of the things that I want to talk about. For time today, I'm not going to go through each of these, but you'll, you'll recognize as I talk some of the words that are in this word cloud. And these slides will be available, so you don't have to worry about trying to capture everything. Basically, for me, health equity, uh, health inequity is what that should say, I'm sorry, is unfair, unjust, and avoidable. Um, and, and that's a very simple introduction in my mind to what we have to do to achieve health equity. Um, and there's a very simple re remedy. We give opportunity and access to different groups so that they can be as healthy as they can without having any barriers in policy or practice that create different health outcomes. It should not matter where you live, what you look like, what your DNA structure is, or, or where you are on the socioeconomic status ladder. That should not matter in terms of your being able to achieve good health. And so we have to acknowledge going into today's conversation that in order to get to the end point of achieving health equity, we have to acknowledge there is a very lethal trio of factors um, that present in, in our health and mental health care systems. One is that significant health disparity that we all know about, that we haven't done enough to undo and eliminate. There's also the unequal health care access that is very clearly a part of each of the areas we're going to talk about today. And then there's the, the final bugaboo of structural racism. Uh, so remember, we start 
our health journey long before any of us becomes ill, which means we can start that opportunity for better health long before we ever have a need for medical care. Your identity, neighborhood, or job should never be a hazard to your health. And everyone here on the planet should have the opportunity to make choices that allow them to have that healthy outcome in their individual lives. Now, I've, t I've chosen three areas that are, as I said, of particular interest to me and where I spend a fair amount of my time today. So I'm gonna quickly go through them and spend just a little time in each talking about some of the things that I think are important. In mentioning Carl Bell, you could not have known, Christina, that I was going to quote Carl Bell. This is one of the famous uh, Bell mantras that I picked up over the years that I have found to be applicable no matter what the topic I'm discussing when it is about vulnerable populations, individuals at risk for poor health outcomes, health disparities, health inequities. This is an all-purpose Carl Bell application to understanding what our work must be. Risk factors are not predictive factors due to protective factors. So because I live in an area where there is environment, there are environmental toxins, or because I have low income, unemployment, poor educational status, because my housing is not up to speed, and because I live in a food desert or face food insecurity every day as risk factors, those need not predict the outcome for me because I live in a community a world community that is filled with protective factors. So just kind of keep that in mind. I generally try to think of that a couple of times a day when people present me with, with issues that are, are complex and need some high level discussion. And it, it all boils down to that mantra from Carl. So we can see here on, on one of the few slides that will have numbers on it. We can see here that there are known determinants of health. And this, this was a 1999 perspective where um, about 90% of what determines our um, I, individual health status has to do with things that are preventable, things that we recognize and can do something about, things that when, when, when the rubber hits the road are of our own making in many cases. The thing we can't control is our genetic makeup and the biology intrinsically in each of us, because that's that's from a different source. But everything else in this in this um, pie chart is something that we have responsibility for. And you can you can quibble with me or argue about the clinical care. But the reality is we create the system of care. And so that 10% that accounts for a determinant that could be a negative outcome, we actually do have a say in. Uh, this is a very quick graphic illustration to kind of capture for those who still have not heard about health disparities or don't believe they're real or would take issue with how we approach resolving and reducing and eliminating them. This is just some of the things that to remember when we're talking about health disparities, particularly as it relates to communities of color and other vulnerable populations and under-resourced areas. Because I always wanna make sure that people understand that while race and culture and ethnicity matter in discussions of these disparities, what we are now recognizing in many ways is that not only do people of color live outside of the usual kind of urban environment that we tend to have these conversations about. But people of color and economically uh, uh, under-resourced people and others live outside of urban areas and struggle with similar kinds of issues. Uh, in some ways more impactful than others. So we've got access to health care. We've got that, that issue around culturally competent or not competent care. We've got how culture can determine what we consider to be an acceptable form of care receipt uh, with many groups relying more on alternative forms 
than more traditional or Western models of care. We've got the barriers in terms of how systems are constructed and maintained, and the general issues around stigma, mis mistrust, and discrimination when it comes to health and mental health are magnified when we talk about um, cultural differences in the communities we are serving. Um, access to and affordability of all treatments will continue to be an issue as long as we don't have uh, a strong uh, health care system that allows everyone to have health care as a right. Um, and that the underrepresentation of people of color who may perhaps be more focused on this kind of research, disparities research. Our underrepresentation in research is something that we have struggled for, for years to overcome. And hopefully as it relates to mental health, we will see a change under this current administration at NIMH, which has vowed uh, and promised that it will take a different perspective in um, identifying and funding areas for research. And then the fact that because of all of these things, people of color and people from minority underrepresented groups often enter treatment later, whether that's for health uh, or mental health care. They enter uh, later and therefore have more challenges uh, once they are there. These are, this is just another way conceptually to look at that last slide in terms of what are the drivers of the social determinants of health that portend poor health outcomes for many. And the final one is the trust issue, which I'll talk about in a, a little later. Uh, but, but that trust issue has been become really magnified in the era of COVID. Uh, and, and we must do something about that particular determinant of health uh, if we are to truly help the populations we're talking about. Now, everyone has seen some variation on this, and I just like to show it because I think it graphically illustrates that it's about the right uh, treatment at the right time for each person and not a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, the difference between equality and equity is graphically illustrated here, and we should take this to heart as we look at how to advance health equity, uh, particularly as it relates to mental health. Sorry. There we go. And, and let's just remember, as I close out the social determinants piece, there are some people who believe that social determinants are too kind of soft and fuzzy and social science and social work. No disrespect to social workers. My first supervisor as a trainee was a social worker, and I remember vividly the lessons that Scotty taught me about working with families and working in community. Uh, so, but there is a science around this beginning or going back further actually than the IOM report on unequal treatment through two Surgeon General's reports on uh, mental health, specifically one on culture, race, and ethnicity. So we've got science to dispel the, the myth that all of this really doesn't matter. You treat everybody the same, everybody benefits. That's really not the case when it comes to some of these issues. And then in the mental health arena, we've got a textbook uh, authored by our dear colleagues, uh, Shem and Compton, on the social determinants of mental health. And if you have not, I would, I would commend it to your reading list, because I think as a starting point, it gives you a big picture understanding of why this is so important in a foundational way. Um, and then there, there are some other things that speak to the dark side um, of medicine and psychiatry. Um, I, if you've not read this, it's, it's a bit dated, but if you've not read Sally Sattel's article on psychiatric apartheid uh, that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, I wanted to include it because it actually does speak about the minority focus groups at San Francisco General as um, you know, that feel good, social worky kind of a thing. And, and we really ought to get back to just basic psychiatric treatment. Um, and I think, I think she did not understand and, and may still not, I, I've never talked with her about it, 
understand the importance and the significance of addressing cultural issues, and most especially in the mental health treatment arena. And then, of course, Harry, Dr. Harriet Washington's book on medical apartheid, which chronicled many of the things that we don't like to remember about how medicine in this country developed on the backs of Black people as test subjects. Um, and we, we've heard the, the more recent studies, uh, stories around the Tuskegee study, uh, around the Henrietta Lack story, and many, many others. But in medicine, people like J. Marion Sims and others uh, really were, were hailed as, you know, um, architects of new um, pieces of medicine, things in medicine, um, long before we understood how they got those results. And, and I just think it's important if we're going to have a complete picture that we acknowledge and make ourselves uh, aware and educate ourselves around the full spectrum of why today's work around eliminating health disparities to achieve uh, health equity is so important and also so challenging. Um, and so second topic, workforce diversity. Um, this is a big ticket item today. We are all talking about diversity in the psychiatric workforce uh, specifically, but in general in medicine, there are all kinds of pipeline programs and faculty development programs and professionalism seminars and uh, underrepresented uh, minorities in medicine um, an underrepresent, an underrepresented in medicine uh, focus groups and DEI task forces and work groups and other things that are taking a look at this. So I, I'm sure you all as a forward thinking uh, institution with all of those things in place, you already know some of this um, that uh, in, in, in an editorial in JAMA, um, uh, the AAMC president at the time um, began a dialogue of the AAMC uh, about this issue and looking forward to what it would take to be a more racially and ethnically diverse faculty in academic medicine. Um, this was in 1998. Uh, certainly for, for those of us in psychiatry, these conversations go back even before that. And for again, for those who do not understand and, and have not read some of the precursors to the work that we're doing in American psychiatry today, take a look at the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1970 in September for a whole section on uh, institutional racism in psychiatry. And take a look at some of the, what were considered then cutting edge uh, recommendations, which I believe in my heart, if we had taken too hard at the time and begun to work on, we'd be a lot farther along in the work we're doing in psychiatry today. But hindsight, um, the Sullivan Commission, uh, chaired by um, former HHS Secretary Lewis Sullivan, offered even more policy recommendations in 2004 in a report that they produced. And most recently, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine has offered two reports through its uh, work groups on um, minorities in medicine um, that, that I think can serve as blueprints if we can consistently maintain movement forward. Um, what often stops us in this work is that people get overwhelmed. They, they don't understand the importance of grace and gracious space. And so they get overwhelmed, they feel personally attacked, they retreat, they get paralyzed. And all of those things limit our ability to think outside the box when it comes to how we implement some of these things. There are multiple curriculum Curriculum, uh, curricula around uh, the country that are in place. Uh, I believe you have one. I know that Yale has one. Uh, other of our major institutions uh, in academic medicine and specifically in psychiatry are using some of these to begin integrating this understanding and this learning into the training for future generations of the behavioral health workforce. So this is not new work, but I will say that I'm impressed with some of the work since the year 2000, beginning with an uh, article in Health Affairs by Val Vanessa Northington Gamble, uh, where she recounts her own 
uh, feelings being in an academic leadership position and being challenged for what she tried to help her institution learn about the impact of these kinds of issues, this type of structural racism on one's ability to practice, on one's ability to learn to be a practicing clinician and how the system needed to understand these things. And that they tried to shoot her down and she wrote this wonderful narrative, which I would encourage everyone to read just for some first person experience um, that's almost two decades old now. And then more recently, of course, we've had uh, in academic psychiatry, uh, a couple of things uh, written about recruitment into academic psychiatry. And um, I, I would be remiss in promoting myself um, and, and, and being happy about the work that I'm doing. If I didn't share with you, if you have not seen it, um, an article that Donna Sudak, uh, who had just left the presidency of um, um, the Academy of Academic, um, not the Academy of Academic Psychiatry, Directors of Residency Training, I'm sorry, um, that we wrote um, kind of tongue in cheek, can we talk, the role of organized psychiatry in addressing structural racism to achieve diversity and inclusion in psychiatric workforce development. And that was just last year during the pandemic that we did that. And then finally, I am so proud, and I'm sure you are as well, that the cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry um, uh, last uh, earlier this year included this DEI graphic. And the first article there uh, was co-authored by our very own uh, Christina Mangurian and a panel of wonderfully exciting, energized and enthusiastic leaders in this area as it relates to um, diversifying the workforce. Um, a final thing that I will, I will mention to you is something that I was introduced to by the same person who helped me understand the concept of gracious space, uh, which was that uh, this article, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, was one that was widely used in the early days of these conversations to before um, Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. This was the go-to article to discuss and begin a dialogue around white privilege, what it was to help um, non-people um, of color understand what was being taken for granted that they weren't aware of, that was actually invisible, that got them through the day with very little stress while those of us who didn't have that privilege uh, had major challenges in those same areas. So after all of this, you might ask, what gives me hope? Well, Dr. Stewart, why do you want to keep doing this? Why do you keep sounding up about this? What makes you smile when you think about these challenges, but there are also solutions? And I just give you this picture. Um, this is a group of very fierce young women leaders uh, in the training, research, clinical services arena. Uh, who have taken it upon themselves to really promote and push and assure that this time this does not die on the vine. And I was honored. This was at my um, uh, annual meeting in San Francisco, actually. Um, and they met in my suite um, to come up with a plan um, for a bunch of things that they were planning to write and do. And I was honored to be in this photo with them uh, to remember always that there is hope for the future uh, in this field. Uh, and I figured it would be nice to embarrass Christina as well. Um, so in, in terms of healthcare diversity, mental health, workforce diversity, there are lots of things for us to take into account. And there are lots of reasons, I think, for us to be hopeful. Uh, these are the days when change can occur. These are the areas where we must focus some of our attention. And I think if, if, we, can, if we can kind of move on to the, to the final of the three areas, uh, the final that, that for me mixes well with understanding social determinants of health and mental health, uh, having an idea about how we overcome some of the challenges 
in our struggle to have some uh, support for diversification of the workforce. And, and let me just say before I move on to community engagement, when people hear workforce diver diversity, they tend to think of more people of color becoming a part of the workforce. And that is true and that is a hope of mine. But in truth, uh, for people who, who have the history in this area, like myself and Francis, for example, uh, we understand that that will never get us to where we need to be in terms of properly serving uh, the increasingly diverse population of individuals needing our care. And so a component of workforce diversity has to be the importance of training for everyone to understand how to better care for people who come from different cultural, racial, ethnic backgrounds, people who bring different sensibilities and thoughts and behaviors and health seeking behaviors, especially into the treatment arena. And for people who have reasons to not trust the workforce and people in the workforce. And so I would, I would want to add in the spirit of gracious space, I would want to add that I include in this as many others do, that this is not just about training up more people of color to be part of the workforce. This is about training the workforce to be more re culturally responsive to anyone who walks through the door. And so uh, I'm gonna quickly go through community engagement. Um, oops, I went too far. Um, this is your basic community engagement slide. And as I said at the beginning, now that I'm a, a Dean for Community Health Engagement, I've had to broaden my perspective beyond just mental health to incorporate more primary care, uh, public health kinds of ideas. But this is the basic framework from which all community engagement springs. Um, nothing about us without us could have been the mantra for community engagement as much as the mantra for uh, consumers and peer uh, mental health uh, groups. There are meetings uh, with individuals in each community so that we don't presume to know what a community wants, needs, or will accept. Uh, from us. And, and I approach this as a member of the academic medical community. And so I have a particular interest in making sure that this is not just viewed as the, the university coming in because they've got a research project and they need subjects. And the minute they get what they want, they're out of here and we don't have anything left. Um, and, and that involves, to overcome that, it involves a whole host of community outreach activities, some that are more educational information, some that are fun to reach that, that, that inner core of people who don't trust you but will come out for information and fun things that they see as beneficial to their communities, to their families, to the areas that they care about and have been working hard on. And remember, in most communities, people have been figuring out ways to solve their problems long before academic communities came and said, let us help. Um, so we have to be mindful and respectful and come with a strong level of humility that we don't know everything about everything. Um, and, and I say it that way because that's really how I generally start out my stakeholder meetings and community outreach activities, acknowledging that I don't know everything about a community. And I'm a native of Memphis and I now work in Memphis. And I still have to say that because I'm one who went away and came back with what they call the Northern way of looking at things. And so I've had to, to work my way back into being a Southerner over the last decade. Uh, and now you can hear the drawl a little bit. Um, we, we offer a lot of our education, particularly during the, the era of COVID, through um, the virtual platforms of Zoom and webinars and other things. Uh, we do a lot of Facebook and Instagram live things, things that I would never have imagined would even come out of my mouth. Um, five years ago, I now have become much more comfortable with. Uh, we look for ways to tie anything that we're working on to something that can be used to advocate for a better system or a better funding stream or a better policy initiative uh, to make changes with the community at our side, or sometimes even leading this effort, because they're actually much more influ influential when it comes to legislation uh, than most of us are. 
And then we, we look for ways to um, assure that we're getting feedback. I've got a full-time research evaluation person who does nothing but help conduct surveys and focus groups and other things. Each time we talk with a group, we wanna know what the impact was of that conversation and whether or not they now have ideas for things they'd like to do or do differently than, than we had in mind. Um, we make sure that for anybody that we encourage to get involved in any of our programs, particularly those that we consider research, community-based, excuse me, participatory research, we make sure that, that we want all of them to have partners from their community as part of that team of researchers. Uh, it can be a bit tricky, but luckily I work in a community that is already primed to be advocates uh, that has a very strong foundation in the church and that from that spring lots of volunteers uh, and then many members of the churches are themselves um, healthcare professionals and so they help us to help people understand what it is we are talking about and then we offer a host of training both for the professional community as well as the communities that we work in around how we believe these things might be useful uh, and helping them to learn how to teach others and educate others and inform them about how to make use of these things. Um, I'm going to end with this because I think it brings me at least full circle with where I started, that we want to achieve uh, health equity. We want to take a look through this talk. I wanted to take a look at three areas, social determinants of, of health and mental health. Uh, the whole uh, discussion around workforce diversity, particularly for me, again, in psychiatry, but more generally throughout the healthcare system. And then finally, how we work with communities to achieve these goals is paramount if we're going to be successful and impactful in a positive way to put these communities in a better place um, than they were. Uh, and so for me, there are four basic tenets that I operate from. One is transparency. People tire of me uh, talking about consistency and clarity and honesty as a means of achieving transparency when I'm in the community. But I have to do that because it speaks to my professional ethical core, first of all, but also because I know the minute I mislead, misrepresent, or actually, even if it's an accident, lie, I have lost the credibility that we struggle so hard to get within community work. And so being transparent often means that I have to admit that my university dropped the ball, that we did something, even inadvertently, that did not feel good in the community, that was not representative of what we spoke about doing or something. I have to own up to that. I have to ask for forgiveness and I have to promise to do better and to be more clear and transparent in my communications bi-directionally to the community and back to the university. There has to be a certain intentionality. And I liken this for those who are fans of Toni Morrison to her perspective and guidance on the centering. And, and that um, in, a, in, a, in a society where centering is based on race and privilege, that for her, the centering became moving to the boundary, to the border of the environment and having others come to her, creating something that drew them to her, as opposed to always having to go into the center uh, of race and privilege. And I, you know, there is a, a wonderful video if, if you um, if you search, put into a search engine, um, Toni Morrison centering quote, it will probably come up and, and she's just so, well, she's Toni Morrison, but she is just so prophetic in terms of her understanding of why we must move away from what my dear friend Ayana Jordan calls a white supremacist model of centering to the Toni Morrison centering guidance model. 
Uh, and then third, there's a commitment. True allies work at this every day. Uh, the microaggressions, the assaults, the hate crimes and everything. True allies never let anything go by unchecked, unspoken, and, and, and will in fact speak out even when it is not comfortable. And so all of us have to practice that level of commitment in order to truly achieve health equity. And then finally, the, the, the accountability factor here here cannot be understated. Uh, humility, giving and accepting grace, but being ready to be confronted and measured holds us all accountable in the, in the final end. Um, and and if, if these four um, principles, if you will, uh, pillars of achieving health equity, equity can be achieved, I think we have a much better chance of this being the anti-racist, not non-racist, because that's not intentional and active, anti-racist approach to improving care and achieving health equity. And with that, I think I'm just about on time. I'm going to say thank you. And um, because I promised I would show um, the, um, my connection to my institution, this is one of our more recent graphics promoting the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis with all of my titles. And I, I should have said at the beginning, the only introduction um, um, needed is that she likes to be in control. So I direct or, or, or lead a bunch of stuff at the university because I like getting things done. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I think I'll stop sharing my screen now and thank you. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Alpha, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. And so we will uh, take questions from the group. Um, you can uh, speak over um, of the chat and I can, um, anybody can chat their questions um, in here and I can, uh, say it or, or it looks like Anne, you were trying to say you you had your hand up do you want to just say something sure oh you have to get on mute oh, just one second i'm gonna have to find her and unmute oh, okay her. so you can or, or you can try to type it yeah we're, we're trying to do more of the questions over the chat if possible oh i'm sorry this would have been too hard to type <laughs> no problem <laughs> so thank you Thank you so much for, for bringing your, your warm, optimistic and loving, graceful voice to this. I have a tough question, you know, encouraged by what you said about allies. I think that as we're, as we're looking at, in a sense, what humility and accountability and consciousness and conscious, we all need, I, I often feel that we need to talk about the fact that for minorities and and others in general you know people who are not mainstream because it's not just being a minority it's being a non-majority that is the burden as you mentioned when you were talking about privilege like what do we do for our people who are in a sense in academic centers or other places and experiencing the growth and consciousness rising of others and that is not a simple place. We know that um, we know that the trajectory and careers of minority leaders or people in academia who have this otherness are more traumatic. We know that there's some actually really good research <clears throat> aligned with some of the research on trauma and its effect on physical health that mm -hmm. looks at very different outcomes that are not predicted by the usual socioeconomic level or or accolades. Right. So depending on whether you're African-American or a woman or there's very different outcomes. And so what what are we what do we need to do to to have some kind of safer environment or debriefing for 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 people who, in a sense, would really not benefit from from just mainstreaming right. um, the information that you're giving? Right. Well, that's a that's a um, an interesting and complex question that I think has, for me, the most basic answer. It begins at the top. It begins with that commitment that 
everything that we do going forward in whatever our areas are, whether it's an organization, whether it's an academic department, whether it's a healthcare system, that we must first and foremost make that commitment that this is the trajectory we want to be on. At the end of the day, what we want to see is that our system responds to the needs of the people in it. And if that need is, I want to be in academic medicine, but some of the things that are required to move up there are not open to me. Typically, for example, um, people of color tend to have much more clinical responsibility and less time, less protected time for research. Part of that has to do with how you are, how you are grown up in the system, how you're trained up in the system, uh, where, where your value as far as the system is concerned lies. We have to, at the top of the pyramid, we have to make the commitment that everyone gets to share with us where they'd like to end and work with us on the best plan for them to get there. And if that means accommodations where someone else may not be able to have all of this and someone else may get some of this, it is not a, you know, um, um, zero sum game. If I get something, you don't have to lose something. It means a reorganizing, a reallocating, a rethinking of the entire organization, not just we're going to accommodate these minority people and we're going to give them a leg up. So sorry, Joe, you've got to lose something. Um, that's not how you do it. You take a look at the entire thing. You decide where your priorities are. If you want a more diverse workforce, you got to do things that are welcoming to people who are diverse or who have an interest in diversity. Now, you can't have it both ways. And that's a leadership challenge. But as I said, it's a very basic answer. Once you make that decision as an organization, as a, a unit, department, system, the plan then has to be structured to maintain that. You've got to hold yourself accountable. You've got to be intentional. You have to have a commitment even when the going gets tough and people complain because now they don't get what they used to get. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean to, to minimize or demean those feelings as much as to help you recognize that's the four principles at work, transparency, commitment, intentionality, and accountability. That's really, and it starts at the top. That's the most basic answer. But thank you for that question, because I got to do a little acting and try out some of my voices. <laughs> And and all that is perfect. And um, and so I've got another question from Dr. Andrea Saratan, and she it's it's related in a way. It's kind of um, are there any suggestions for training mentors to mentor across differences, right? Given that there are very few um, uh, people of color in high leadership roles. Yes, and and I would you know at some point when I write the story of my own uh, experiences in training. Uh, I, I can share with you a few things. I had a supervisor uh, who, who is now deceased, um, uh, who turned into a mentor who became my strongest supporter and sponsor. His name was Paul Fink. Uh, some of you may know that name and no one on earth would have paired me with Paul Fink. Paul became so integral in my professional development that at a time when I was um, in Philadelphia and they had this Philadelphia Psychiatric Society used to do this summer dance. And I had a date for the dance. I wasn't married. I had a date for the dance. And the poor young man who accompanied me to the, to the dance was grilled by Paul Fink about his intentions. That's how close my mentor, sponsor, role model person became in my life. Uh, I've had a host of people, uh, men, women, Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, uh, over the years who have graced me with wisdom from them, with their life experiences. As I, as I ran for president of the APA, I look back to those people and people like Rod Munoz and uh, Paul Fink and uh, Richard Harding and others. You know, we had never had a black president, so there was no model for that. But these were all people who graced me with their wisdom 
uh, Carol Nadelson, Carol, Carolyn Rabinowitz, Nada Stadler. There were so many people. And so I'm a big proponent of do not limit your opportunities for learning from mentors to only people who look like you. Not every relationship will work out well, but for the most part, I became a much more expansive, in the words of Alexandra Simmons, expansive personality, thanks to my willingness to allow people who didn't look like me to impact me and my growth and development professionally. And I will be forever grateful to Paul Fink. Turns out the guy and I didn't work out, but I'm not sure that it was because Paul acted like a daddy uh, and ran him away. <laughs> I love that. And then from the from the grandfather of cultural psychiatry, Dr. Yeah. Francis Liu actually asked a question. So could you have a, make a brief comment on the APA Presidential Task Force on Social Determinants of Mental Health um, and the APA annual meeting theme? Um, the annual meeting theme for this year around social determinants of uh, mental health I think was derived from some of the work. And thank you, Francis. It's always a pleasure to have you in the audience and to see you. Uh, I think some of I think some of Dr. Pender's thoughts came directly from the past year's dialogues that grew out of the um, the work of that structural um, task force on uh, the task force on structural racism. Um, I think a lot of things that many of us had known for years were concretized in the work of that task force. I think there was an awakening, uh, I won't say woke, uh, but I think there was an awakening in the leadership that these are not things that we can ignore any longer. Um, I mentioned in my talk, the 1970 um, journal, American Journal of Psychiatry uh, special section on institutional racism in psychiatry. I know that I personally have referred people to that for the last decade, let's just say, you know, uh, and and for the first time I had people saying, I read it, I, I see what you mean. Uh, and that was, that was very telling to many of us who had been around the APA for a long time, because this was not news. Um, you know, we, we knew there were major issues. We knew that the APA, bless its heart, as we say in the South, had done a good job of trying but there were these, as I mentioned in the talk, there were these stops and starts where you got a little traction. The Surgeon General's report on race, culture, and ethnicity. We were part of a work group to implement, to develop and implement a plan. We began that work. It started and then it kind of fizzled. Um, I had a, um, a retreat as president on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We had a plan. It started and kind of fizzled. I think the, the, the triple... Um, dynamic of pandemic, economic uh, uh, descent into hell, excuse my language, and, um, and then the social uh, injustices that just got heaped on over the last couple of years, uh, and the fact that we were all locked up and couldn't run away from what we were seeing. We couldn't busy ourselves with other things because we were we were tied to our 24 hour news cycle and in our streets, there were people protesting and people were saying things that we'd never heard them say before. And then there was this whole host of other stuff that started happening. So I, I think the connection for me of the task force work and the theme for the APA meeting is that finally we stayed on track, you know it's like that line out of Star Trek. Uh, Star Wars, stay on target, stay on target, stay on target. So we became Luke Skywalker and we stayed on target. <laughs> and and the, the, the president, the current president of the APA, Vivian Pender, has decided that this is going to continue to be uh, an important issue for the APA under her leadership. And we, we hope that subsequent administrations uh, at the APA president and staff will continue along this path and not drop the ball again. And, and, and then we've only got one more minute, but I'll ask a softball question, which is a little related. It's by uh, Dr. Robin Cooper, who was asking, she had a very more sophisticated question within her chat, but just if you could comment on where you see leadership in our profession on the interface between social determinants of health and different disparities and climate change. 
um, because as you know, you've been, anyway, you know about the strong work that she's been leading in this space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and thank you, Robin. Good to see you. Uh, and, and I will tell you, and, and this, may, this may matter more, mean more to Robin than anyone else, but I was in one of the first meetings of APA leadership and the climate change, what became, I think, the caucus and then the committee. I, I always lose track of component structure. But I was in one of those first meetings and saw the absolute disappointment on the faces of my colleagues who thought we weren't getting it fast enough. And um, and they convinced me because uh, I was, I think, secretary. No, I was president elect, I guess, at the time. Uh, and so they convinced me to write an article for um, the journal on psychiatry and climate change that I'm very proud of still. And they convinced us uh, and that had to be what five years ago, they convinced us to begin working towards all kinds of things like investments in non fossil fuel companies and other stuff that are finally coming to fruition. The APA is like, and I, I should disclose here, I am not speaking on behalf of the American Psychiatric Association. The opinions I express are my own uh, for the record. But, but I think if you think of the APA as this huge ship in the middle of the ocean trying to turn on a dime, um, I really think we have made over the last five years tremendous steps in the right direction. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. Can we, and I, I just saw something pop up about the racism and climate change um, uh, series. Uh, can we begin now to have these conversations in an environment where everybody doesn't walk away angry or disappointed? Yes. But thank you for that. Well, excellent, excellent answer. And it was just such a pleasure to have you. I'm going to have to wrap us up, unfortunately, but maybe all of us can give virtual claps uh, for, uh, for Dr. Stewart. And you can see all of us in the just what a great presentation you had. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you, thank you. All right, thank you everybody for being here.